Thank you all. What is that for? Um, my name is Bill Wurpahowski, and I am the director of the Center for Peace and Justice Education and the chair of uh, MLK 2010. I want to thank, as we move forward, uh, or before we move forward, the staff at the Center for Peace and Justice Education for their coordinating this wonderful program involving the National Comprehensive Center for Fathers last night and the Freedom School tomorrow. Particularly, I want to thank Carol Anthony, who has been essential for many, many years in this area. Uh, so thank you. This is the featured event of MLK 2010, and, and rightly so. Uh, I want initially to give recognition to our co-sponsors, who are many and considerable. They include the August, Augustine and Culture Seminar, Africana Studies, the Department of Communications, the Student Groups for the Center for Peace and Justice Education, the Ethics Program, the Honors Program, Department of History, the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Office of Mission and Ministry, Sociology, and the Offices of Student Development and Student Life. We could not have done this um, uh, event without their considerable support and help. So uh, I want to thank them before we proceed. Um, if, if I may say, say so, we've had a rather illustrious history of speakers for this particular event celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. They include Cornell West, Michael Eric Dyson, Patricia Williams, Lucius Outlaw, and just last year, Melissa Harris Lacewell. And it is our honor here at Villanova to continue this history by welcoming Dr. Philippa T. Bagoff, Assistant Professor of Social Psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Professor Goff earned his baccalaureate degree in Afro-American Studies at Harvard and his PhD in Social Psychology at Stanford University in 2005. Between 2005 and 2008, he served as an assistant professor of psychology at Penn State. There, he founded and coordinated the Africana Research Center's postdoctoral fellowship program. Since that time, Goff was a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation, and of course, he assumed his current post in psychology at UCLA. His research and publications are rich challenging and impressively practical in their consideration of interracial conflict, stereotyping, and mental representations related to prejudice. In one series of studies, he has shown that priming white participants with black male faces led to an increased ability to process crime-relevant objects, which would in turn suggest the presence of an automatic association between black males and crime. In another project that builds on his laboratory work demonstrating an automatic association between African Americans and apes, he found that newspaper articles written about black criminal defendants were more likely to contain animal imagery than those written about white defendants. Crucially, the presence of this animal in imagery in this form of communication is predictive of death sentencing. Goff's present work seeks to understand the role that race plays in relations between police officers and the communities they would help. He is especially attentive to the role that different kinds of experience of threat, as generated by stereotypes and ideologies of masculinity, will play in police officers' decisions to use force in encounters with their public. His interest in race and police work led him to co-found the Consortium for Police Leadership in Equity, which he also serves as executive director for research. The Consortium facilitates concrete and ongoing research and collaboration between American police departments and social scientists, and all for the goal of improving policing and police community relations. For these and his other achievements, Dr. Goff was recently awarded the 2009 Louise Kidder Early Career Award from the Society for Psychological Study of Social Issues. 
His is a remarkable early career indeed. Looks like a pretty complete career to me, actually, already. But his work goes on, thank goodness. Now, just for a moment, here at Villanova, that name Goff might ring a bell. <laughs> he is the son of the director and dean of the honors program, Edwin Goff, and we want to welcome Professor Goff and Florence, his parents, tonight for this event. The title of Philip Goff's address tonight is Revolutionary Impatience, Charting a New Path to the Mountaintop. We're very, very grateful to have you here. God bless you. Thank you. Please give a warm welcome to Philip Atiba Goff. Thank you very, very much, Bill. I'd like to uh, thank everyone who made it possible to, for, for me to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Sharon. Where is Sharon? Cleaning up. Okay, Sharon's cleaning. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, she deserves so much thanks. Um, and Carol, who's uh, sent the initial email. Um, my mother and father, without whom, of course, I wouldn't be here, quite literally. Um, <clears throat> and the rest of my Villanova family. Um, it is the case, I mean, and I was, it's actually written here in my notes, but and where's, where's Joe? Um, it is the case that there is um, one valued and dread question um, that I always get whenever I come back to Villanova. Do you remember me? Because the last time that I was here, I was about this tall, playing under the desks of so many of your faculty and colleagues. Um, so it's a special homecoming uh, for me here to, to honor Brother Martin Luther King Jr. Um, for the last several years, I've had the tremendous good fortune to have occasion to reflect on the life and the legacy of Brother Martin Luther King Jr. And I have yet to feel equal to that task. How does one really get behind honoring the life and legacy of this man? And I'll take it to one step further. How does one get behind equaling the task of honoring all of those for whom Brother Martin is a substitute? Meaning those who marched with, not in the first row or the second row or the 12th or the 24th, those who did not have engraved invitations to the march, whose names are rarely written in the history books, not often spoken except at family reunions, but whose contribution to our collective history are synonymous with the legacy of King. How does one come to equal all of those lives? Now I'll take a quick break here to get you prepared for how I try and do that tonight. I am not in the black church tradition, but I am certainly of the black church tradition. You don't have to say amen, but we will do a little bit of call and response. So when I call, I hope that you will be able to respond. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. <clears throat> So this was my task, um, yet again this year, my honored task, to try and become equal to the honor of what we do every year, um, at least once a day, those of us who remember what the day is for and don't just take off. Um, and so this year it occurred to me that it was not always such an intimidating task to honor those who came before. In fact, when I was in college, I thought I was going to be better at it than anyone ever in the history of the world. Um, and so I want to share a little bit of a story of how I became, as my father would say, humbled um, <clears throat> by the task at hand. Um, there was a, a wonderful program that was being put together at my undergraduate institution. And uh, some of the panelists were Kathleen Cleaver and Bobby Seale. This is Bobby Seale right after he had come out with the DVD on barbecuing, which is something <laughs> slightly less than a revolutionary act, but somewhat tasty. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, Kathleen Cleaver and Bobby Seale were there, and I happened to be in African American Studies um, as, a, as a major at the time. And we got to escort them to the cookie reception afterwards. Um, and as someone who was supposedly outstanding in the, in the department, I was the one leading them. And while I was leading them, instead of listening to the wisdom of the generation before me, I talked their ear off about what my generation was going to do. Our revolution is going to look like this. Our revolution is going to take what you did, which was OK. And we're going to do so much better. Our revolution is going to look like this, and this, and this, and then we're going to solve all the problems, and then we shall rest. And by the time I was done with that spiel, Bobby Steele was on one knee, crying, 
cry. Not because I had moved him, um, but because I was hilarious. <laughs> And he needed help to get up, not because he was old, but because I was preposterous. Um, and he said, boy, do you know how much smarter we are than you? <laughs> and he was not joking. And I said, no, no, I do not know how much smarter you are than me, but I have a sense I'm about to hear. Um, and, and he said, we, we were, each individually person standing here is infinitely smarter than you will ever be. We have had experiences that you could not hope to imagine, that you will never read about, and I sure as heck is not in whoever made the movie of our lives that we did not co-sign on. <laughs> and our movement failed and was co-opted. We died twice, and I'm sitting here in front of you. Your revolution is in your books. We thought we had the answers to the questions. We didn't even have the questions right. Your revolution's in your books. So clearly, as a strong-headed college undergraduate, I thought this was a simply crotchety old man and he needed to go away. <laughs> um, I didn't say as much, we had cookies, I went on my way, my ego was hurt, um, I studied some more, and I had the good fortune uh, to be host to another relatively large event a couple of years later, um, in my junior year. Um, and at this event, which was the first annual Black Arts Festival for Boston, um, I had the great pleasure of one of the previous panelists here, uh, my godfather, who I call Uncle Lou, Lucius Outlaw, was one of the panelists. Right? He, was a, is, he is and was a philosopher talking about the black experience in art. And afterwards, it is him and the representative of Sonia Sanchez. Um, we've got Delfeo Marsalis there. Quest Love from the Roots is there. Right? And again, I am a genius. I can conquer the earth with what we have put together. Not so much we as me, but what we have done is tremendous, and this is worthy of celebration. Again, perhaps not ironically, we are headed back to the faculty club where I am leading my previous generation and the current leader of this generation back there for cookies, <laughs> which is the snack of revolutionaries. <laughs> And I'm explaining to them all of the things that I've learned in the two years since crotchety old Bobby Seale, who was not invited, um, <clears throat> had told me that my revolution was in my books. And again, there is laughter and merriment. So much so that my Uncle Lou pulls me aside and I'm no longer the leader of the group. The group goes on without me. And my Uncle Lou explains to me, and again, these, tend, these moments tend to be led with one word, boy. <laughs> in order to affect your revolution, and he said it with a deep and, and genuine love. In order to affect your revolution, you're not gonna need a revolutionary mindset, a revolutionary script, or a revolutionary tongue. You're going to need a revolutionary patience. And I had no idea what he meant, but I knew he had just blown my mind. And it took me from junior year to senior year to understand what a revolutionary patience was going to entail. And so I want to start a little bit, and that's just like a goth, it's been 20 minutes and I'm still in the introduction. <laughs> <clears throat> Talking to you about what a revolutionary patience might entail. And there are two things that I have come to understand it entailing. And I get to talk to Uncle Lou and he says I'm pretty much there, so I don't feel bad repeating it. The first is a wide-angle lens on our history. What we take part in in the struggle for civil rights is clearly not just a racial endeavor. It's not just race and gender. It's not just race, gender, sexual orientation, class, and the litany of things for which there are clubs at this august institution. It is the historical struggle between those who don't have against those who do. It is the original struggle between those who are on the bottom and those who have created the top. This is the struggle between our angels and our demons, between our better selves and original sin. Not to put it in too grand a term, but that's what a wide angle lens on history can reveal. And the second component is we must be diligent in our pursuit of the truth, right? And those two things go hand in hand. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about being diligent 
in pursuit of the truth. And how that can help us to honor Brother Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I hate it when Brother Cornell takes all my best material, but as he said on Monday, it's important on days like this that we don't disinfect Brother Martin. That we don't sanitize Brother Martin because it's convenient and easier. We don't want to purify or sterilize or deodorize Brother Martin. We actually want a little funk in our Martin Luther King Jr. Okay? We don't want it clean and easy because clean and easy is a lie. We don't want it devoid of soul because with that soul comes a little funk. Okay? <clears throat> and we have been lying on Brother Martin for years. Talking about color blindness, talking about content of character, and not talking about children and poverty and families without jobs. We have been lying on Brother Martin. We got a day to remember him, during which period we forget. And so I want to read a little bit of Brother Martin towards the end of his life when he is contending with the lies that are being told about him in his honor. With regards to the idea that black is somehow inferior, he said, we do not have anything to be ashamed of because somebody told a lie one day. They couched it in language. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. Look in your dictionary and see the synonyms of the word black. It's always something degrading and low and sinister. Look at the word white. It's always something pure, high, and clean. I want to get the language right tonight. That's what Brother Martin said. And I want to get the language right tonight, too. I want to say I'm tired of lying about Sister Rosa Parks. I'm tired of lying about it. I'm tired of hearing the lies about it. For those of you who don't know, she was not tired. I'm not saying that black women weren't tired. I'm not saying that trying to bury, living long enough to bury your children and prop up men who feel like their manhood is stripped from them isn't backbending. I'm saying Rosa Parks that day was not tired. Decades of activism and being old enough to know how to get arrested for the things that you believe in. That's what happened. And let me tell you the consequences of the lie and taking the funk from Sister Rosa Parks. The consequences are the humiliation reaped upon Ch Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Let me put that together for you. Because Rosa Parks wasn't an activist, she clearly could not have been a leader of the NAACP. There's no way that she had been instrumental in engineering the election of Dr. Martin Luther King to the SELC. There's no possibility that she had given her life in exchange for the privileges that we take for granted. There's no way that she was an activist. Because of that, when Judge Soda, Sotomayor, Sonia Sotomayor, is insinuated to have sat in the room with the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, which is an organization that advocates for civil rights, it's a liability to being a justice of the Supreme Court. Say somebody told a lie one day. And now we need to get the funk back. I'm tired of lying about our children. I'm tired of children without soul and without funk. What do I mean? I'm talking about footnote 11 in Brown versus Board of Education. For those of you who haven't read it, footnote 11 is the thing that allows social scientists like me to pretend that we know anything about the law. Footnote 11 is the reference to the Clark and Clark doll studies that said, in fact, segregation makes black children have low self-esteem. Segregation by itself is an injury to the souls and spirits of our young black boys and girls. And based on the strength of the evidence marshaled in footnote number 11, there was scientific basis to roll back segregation. Say somebody told a lie one day because that science is inaccurate. The science that is the foundation of desegregated schools is a lie. In fact, African-American children have higher self-esteem than any other kids in the country. 
except when they attend integrated schools. It is the integration that draws down black children's self-esteem. And so now we are stuck with no language to talk about how integration is a problem as well as a solution, so we get no child left behind, except all of our children are left behind. And what happens when our children are left behind? Well, since they're not children, they get locked up like adults. Which is why the 50,000 African-American children who are in detention right now get counted as 10,000 because most of them are housed in adult facilities. Say, somebody told a lie one day. But we're here not just to talk about the movement and all the people that Brother Martin represented. We're here to talk about and honor the man of Martin Luther King Jr. So let's talk about some of the lies people have been telling about Martin Luther King. He was the first. He was the first of his kind and the last of his kind. Say somebody told a lie one day. Montgomery bus boycott, which is the beginning of his first admits, is a whole year after the first Brown v. Board of, of, of Education decision. And Brown v. Board of 1954 is a full 21 years after the beginning of the Margold Plan, the legalism era. People have been working to create the space for Martin Luther the King to come forward since before he was able to go to school. I want to talk a little bit about Famous First because it is peculiarly relevant to this year and this time of Famous First, particularly in black history. So we know about Rosa Parks, but do we know that she was not a Famous First? Rosa Parks was not, this is my favorite civil rights story, she was not, was not, was not the chosen one for that bus. She was number two. Number one was a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Colvin. She was active in her local chapter of the NAACP. She was an honor student. She was fantastically clean cut, knew how to handle herself in public. And she was dragged off and beaten by police officers on the way to jail. And that was going to be the case. And not only was it going to be the case, she was the one who said it needed to happen. She orchestrated it at 15 years old. Who feels they haven't accomplished anything yet all the way in college? <laughs> but we don't know her name. And the reason we don't know her name is because she was 15. And at 15, an older married gentleman gained her trust and got her pregnant. And the NAACP said, we need our victims to be pure. So would you please step aside for the movement? And she said, yes. But I will be named in the court case that brings this down. And she was. That's a famous first. We know about famous persons in the black community, and the first one that comes to mind usually is Jackie Robinson. Never took steroids. <laughs> Happened to be a quite excellent ball player and the first African American to play in the major leagues. But do you know that Jackie Robinson was the second best athlete in his family? And he had, a younger, uh, had an older brother, Mac, who in 1936 in Hitler's Germany ran the 200 meters in the Olympics faster than any other human being had ever run it. Now this is important, because Hitler said the 200 meter, that's our race. Not only is Germany gonna, gonna win that, but it will prove the superiority of the Aryan nation. We're gonna sweep. Mac Robinson ran the 200 meter faster than any other human being had ever been recorded running it. Why do we not know his name? Well, we don't know his name because he came in second. The man who came in first was Jesse Owens. But those two black men stood on the, on the podium and silently, without having to raise their fists, were a symbol against what was going on in Nazi Germany. Famous firsts are to be celebrated. They are to be revered. We know them in history. But we tend to stop counting afterwards. And that's a lie that we tell ourselves. Because famous firsts are not the end of the story. They can't possibly be the end of the story. If you don't have two black men on the podium, it's not the same. If you don't have Claudette Colvin, you don't get Rosa Parks. 
And now we have this famous first in President Obama. And I woke up the next day to find out racism is over. We are post-racial. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. And I, I, I stopped being black. Who knew? And I guess he did too. And all of us are just one post-racial mess. We all have become Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Except somebody told a lie one day. <laughs> and we now know that's not true. If we didn't know it before. It's not to say that if you happen to get a little liquored up on that night, that you didn't have just cause. It's not to say that there wasn't something tremendous, groundbreaking, that for me, young as I am, I never thought I would live to see. I, I lied to my students all semester long, saying it's never gonna happen. Forget about it, it's never gonna happen, it's not gonna win the primary. Nope, nope, are you serious? <laughs> all right, all right, all right, that's cool. But there's, it's never gonna happen. He's not gonna win the general. And then McCain nominated Palin, I said, are you serious? <laughs> oh, this might, this might could happen. <clears throat> but we're not done. We can't possibly be done. We have the first African-American president. We have the first African-American attorney general. I, at this point, can't tell you which one is more important. But we can't wait around and celebrate because just celebrating famous firsts is a lie because celebrating them forgets that they are a shame and an embarrassment. So if you didn't hear it before, hear it from a devout liberal now. President Obama is an embarrassment. He is a shame, and we should all hang our heads. Not because of his performance in this first year, but because it took us so long. Because that's why we celebrate famous firsts. Because of the shame and the indignity of the time it took us to get there. Are y'all there with me? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> We've lied about the movement, which we put capital T, capital M. We've lied about Brother Martin. And we've lied about what we've been doing. Now, I am a social psychologist. Some of you have taken psychology classes in here. So you know that that's not just up there with my title. It's up there because it is the crutch known as PowerPoints and I am naked without it. There will be slides. <clears throat> but my research is how we have been lying on racism. Racism is not just that which stems from the contaminated hearts and minds of southern rednecks that tend to wear overalls and chew on straw. <laughs> if you thought that's all it was, you were wrong. You were lied to. It is not just that which lives in the contaminated hearts and minds of those who would rather not see that couple move into that neighborhood. Racism is not about racist white people. It never has been for anybody who truly cared. If that's been your definition of racism, a little bit of education for you. Your racism is racist. Because your racism is only concerned with white people. And if you're only concerned with white people, well, that was the problem in the first place. Racism can happen with racists, and it can happen without racists. It can happen because of contaminated hearts and minds, and it can happen with the best of intentions. It can happen because people don't know any better, can't self-interrogate, and it can happen with committed, devout progressives in the room. We need to talk about racism without racists. Because otherwise, we can't explain what's going on now and what's going to be going on until we fix it. All right? My technical definition is the, it's the quintessential, the fundamental contemporary conundrum of contemporary race relations. I got slides. <clears throat> what the heck do I mean? Let's take a look at stereotypes. From 1933 to 2000, top four, superstitious, lazy, ignorant. These are white stereotypes of black people. Not so good in 1933. It's a little bit better in 2000. In fact, it's a lot better. They go away. Prejudice is going away. Don't be an uninformed liberal. Prejudice is going away. It's not just hiding somewhere. 
It's receding. That's good news. Things do get better. The problem is, inequality is not. This is the ratio of black to white. Now, I can do this with Hispanic to white. Right? And believe it or not, I can do this with Asian to white. And here in infant mortality, you see around 2 to 1. And from 49 to 2005, it's getting worse. Unemployment, from 49 to 2008, it's getting worse. And though it doesn't go back far enough, poverty from 67 to 05 is getting worse. Our prejudices are receding. Our inequality is not. So let me say it again. Racism is not about white people. It never has been. And if you thought it was, you've been lied to. I want to get the language right tonight. Racism can happen even absent malicious intent. Let me show you what I'm talking about in the context that I know best, which is the context of policing. We did an experiment. I'm not going to bore you with data. I'm just going to show you what an experiment looks like when you really catch it right. I work with police all day, every day. And after working with them for a little while, you realize a lot of what's going on there, particularly for police men, is that when they're on the street, their masculinity is threatened. And it turns out that masculinity being threatened happens more when you're encountering a black subject than a white subject. Why? Because black men are stereotyped as hypermasculine. Now, I stand here as evidence that the stereotypes are not always true. <laughs> but it is true that black and Hispanic men are stereotyped as hypermasculine. Macho is not an English word. So now, if I'm concerned about proving my manhood and I encounter an African American, I am much more likely to use force to assert my manhood than if I'm concerned about it and I'm encountering someone who's white. Well, that's racism. There are racial consequences for that. But you're not going to catch it if all you're doing is looking for racist people. If you bought into the lie, you wouldn't be able to find it. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We did an experiment. Brought in a bunch of real live police officers, because that's what I do. And we said, interact as if you're out on the street. We did this in their use of deadly force training facilities. Okay, so this is where they train to use deadly force. This is how they are on the streets. I know, because I follow these individuals that you're about to see on the streets. This is real life for them. It's training because we can't actually have them doing it, but it's, it's as close to real life as you can get. We have them deal with compliant and non-compliant black, white, and Latino suspects. I'm going to show you a video of a non-compliant black suspect, and then we're going to show you how people respond to it. This is the high sign that we need to stop recording an unresponsive individual who is clearly agitated with a weapon. Does that sound like anything you've ever read in the press before? That's a good shooting. It's not motivated by racial prejudice, but it only tends to happen to black men. We have exactly the same video with a white individual who's the same height, same weight, same level of physical attractiveness, same blocking, so lit up for those of you who are actors, same exact positioning, same words. We even tampered with the pitch, so the pitch is the exact same, volume's the exact same. The white guy doesn't get shot, and prejudice doesn't help you fix it. Understanding how precious they are doesn't tell you anything. It's understanding how macho they are. Somebody told a lie, said racism was about white people. It's not. It's not about how prejudiced individuals are. It's not about racist people and figuring out who's good and who's bad. About proving that I'm not racist. It's never been about that. And like I said tonight, I want to get the language right. Now, I've told you about this wide-angle lens, about diligently pursuing the truth in order to get to a revolutionary patience. But the title of this talk is not a revolutionary patience. It's a revolutionary impatience. Why is that? I'm an academic, and so I cannot just plagiarize someone else and give a talk. That's one. <laughs> Two. <clears throat> Revolutionary patience will show you the enormity and the gravity of what it is that we have to deal with. This is not about bad people. This is about the very ways in which we construct our identities 
construct our manhood, construct what it means to be a good person in the world. It's so enormous, in fact, that revolutionary patience can give you a revolutionary panic attack. And so from time to time, we have to decide that it's not worth waiting. That in fact, we have to go now at what isn't possible knowing how impossible it is. And occasionally, you get a black president out of that. So, I was actually just talking to Jasmine, I don't know if Jasmine made it up from, from dinner up to here, about cartoons. I take a lot of solace in sort of childhood artistic expression. And so let me give you an example of what I mean by a revolutionary impatience. It's not possible to read, but I'll read it for you. It's an observatory, the top left. There's a scientist checking calculations. He says, oh my lord, it's not a mistake. There's an asteroid coming, and it will absolutely wipe out everything on the globe. He goes and reports it. He says, there's an asteroid coming. Wipe out everything on the globe. His colleague says, is there nothing we can do? There's nothing we can do, probably. <laughs> then reports it, and the president, the leaders, say, there's an asteroid coming. And there's nothing that we can do, probably. Pray for a miracle. You can see families huddling, huddling together. People praying. People showing signs. People looting. People spending time with their loved ones and coming together. And then there's a little girl with a baseball bat. I gotta tell you, I had a hard time not crying the first time I saw this. Because this is what it's like to do social justice work. You are a little girl on a mountaintop with a baseball bat and an asteroid is coming. And if you don't stand there, then there's no one doing anything. So a revolutionary impatience requires a revolutionary patience. It requires that wide-angle lens to history. It requires that we're diligent about keeping ourselves funky. <laughs> but it also requires that we be quixotic. That in the face of all the probabilities, the enormity of what we're dealing with, we choose to stand now and not later. That's the revolutionary impatience that I think Brother Martin embodied. That the movement came to be synonymous with and that we've lost the language for. Because instead of it being about communities, mothers and fathers in the kitchen saying, yes, they may firebomb the house, but we're taking the kids out of school and going on the march. Yes, this was a quiet community before and I'm willing to make it loud so that no one has to go through this ever again. People taking second and third jobs and didn't have time to march. It wasn't about that when we remembered it in Getty Images, the Associated Press, and Reuters. But it is about that right now. And we may have leaders that we like. Maybe not as charismatic. Maybe they got to deal with Congress, so they're not allowed to be. But without the rest of us, they are by themselves. And this iteration will pass us by. We'll have to wait for a new time to be impatient. And so, as we are moving on universal health care, which is, by the way, the right for people not to die because they're poor, regardless of what you think about the actual legislation, that's what it is. That's what the goal is. While we're fighting about that instead of agreeing about it, while we are fighting about whether or not people can partner with whom they love, whether or not that's a human right and whether or not the people that want to partner with folks we don't think they should are even humans at all in the, the mind of the law, while we're fighting about that and not agreeing on it, may I encourage on this day and everyone forward that we embrace Dr. King's revolutionary impatience, that wide angle lens of history that diligence to the truth, the unwillingness to let a lie go unchallenged, and that spark of creative naivete and wonderment at what we can accomplish in the face of all the knowledge of what we haven't before. Thank you very much.
now you're just embarrassing me. Um, uh, if we have a little bit of time for some Q&A, um, and I am happy to discuss with my Villanova family. So I don't see that there, that there are microphones there, so just raise your hands and I will hopefully see you. So the question for those who couldn't hear is about the word colored, which previously was the most common word to describe color folks, right? Because black wasn't in the vocabulary. Black was a negative term that was then reclaimed. We have one of those negative terms that has been reclaimed by a certain generation now as well. But that wasn't the question. The question was about colored. Um, there's, I'll put this within the context of uh, Senate Majority Leader's um, unfortunate comments recently, um, referring to uh, President Obama, then Senator Obama, as a light-skinned Negro, a light-skinned individual with no uh, de detectable Negro dialect unless he chose. Um, I think our words matter. Um, I don't personally like the word colored to describe anyone because um, I tend to see white people as having a color. Right? When I talk about folks, I tend and talk about things in terms of social justice in the United States, I talk about whites and non-whites, because that's what I mean. Right? <clears throat> Occasionally I'll talk about blacks, because there's a cultural legacy there, and Asians and Latinos, and, and manage that, right? and American Indians who we always forget. But mostly, I'm talking about whites and non-whites, because I think it's specific. And colored was nicer than Negro. It was more inclusive as well. But it always left the dominant group unmarked. And I think that we do that at our own peril. And I think that wide angle lens of history reminds us that we do that at our own peril. It's a great question. So the, for those who couldn't hear, um, you saw two white officers. Is it the same with other races of officers? So I, wanna, I also want to pick up on your, your, word of, the, your term affirmative action for police. It's usually not affirmative action, it's consent decrees. So the Department of Justice has to go in and make them take people, which is different than affirmative action, right? Um, and when they're do, what they're doing there is they're making them take people up to a minimal percentage, which is usually the maximum percentage. Um, the quick answer to your question, the deeper question, which is do you see racial differences, is no. Black officers look like this, Latino officers look like this. Because everybody's got these stereotypes. Got to meditate on that one for a little bit. I'm Mr. Good News Happy Sunshine. I study only positive, uplifting things, like dehumanization, child abuse, domestic violence, and police violence, and the death penalty. self-identify as black. Um, but what I'm talking about in terms of social justice, what are the groups we care about? We care about dominant group, and, and there are not multiple dominant groups racially in this country. There's a dominant group, and it's white people, right, racially. And then there's everybody else, and how do you clump them together? Well, there's, they can call, you can call them colored. I don't like that, right? You can call them people of color. I don't know why that's any better. Um, <laughs> Like, am, I, am, I, am I a Philadelphian? Am I of Philadelphia? Sure, that's a longer way to say it, but. Um, but we're talking about white people and everybody else. So I could call them the everybody else's, um, but non-white sort of makes sense to me as a, as a social analyst, right? But how we self-identify, that's a whole other ballgame. It's a whole other ballgame that becomes much more complicated um, because of the sort of idiosyncratic pains that people go through, especially when they live their lives in the interstices and the cracks between very obvious and easy to identify groups, which is going to be happening more and more and more. If I was giving you a full PowerPoint, I'd show you the demography. It's very hard to be easily one thing, unless you live in Malibu. <laughs> it's just, that's my demographic say that. You said that attitude 
attitudes that count for 10% of behavior. At best. And I wasn't clear what the other 90% of the two study is. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. So the uh, question was, attitudes account for 10% of behavior. What's the other 90%? Um, that's the stuff that will get me tenure. Um, that's how I like to call it. Um, it's all situations are people times situation. And the stable parts of the people are about 10% of it when it comes to behaviors, especially racial behaviors. So the situations are that. But what do we call situations that create racial discrimination? We don't have good language for it. You know, if you're very educated, you might say, well, that's sort of like structural discrimination, but it's not quite the same thing. And so since we don't have good language for it, I don't talk about it at great length, because then I would just be confusing. But that's what we're talking about, the situations that tend to produce discrimination, regardless of the attitudes of the individual. Here and then, and then there. So the question is, how can naivete be a virtue? I, I happen, I, I know some folks that, are, that have worked fairly closely with the Obama administration and uh, on the Obama campaign. And every one of them, to a man, to a woman, has said to me, if we knew what we had to go through um, and what it was going to take to actually win, we would never have started. I said, well, I'm glad that you guys were dumb. Because you were pretty smart. That's how it can help, right? So when you see the enormity of the thing and imagine naively that you can make a difference, then sometimes people want to join you. And that's a virtue. Over here. Yeah, on the statistical chart you made concerning poverty, unemployment, and infant mortality rate, uh, concerning the uh, black people as you defined it on the graph, uh, did you do that with the white community, Asian community? So I'm uh, the woman uh, asking about the chart that I showed. Let me get it back up on the screen. I can find this. All right. So this is the ratio of blacks to whites. All right. So here, one to one, that would be as if you were as likely to be uh, unemployed being black or white. Two to one is that you're twice as likely to be unemployed if you're black than if you're white. Three to one, you're three times as likely to be impoverished if you're black than if you're white. And those numbers, by the way, go up to about five to one if you're a black child. And here, around two to one is the infant, infant mortality rate. So it's not just the, the rate on its own, it's the rate as compared to whites. And again, they look not quite this bad, but similar when you're, when you're uh, showing Latinos. Yeah. Um, can you speak to it, um, a comment that you made before about the naivete? Mm -hmm. That in many ways is so helpful in allowing people to do work that they wouldn't do if they knew they had what was going. But that fused with this wider angle of vision of the historical condition that gave rise to many of these movements, because they almost sound sort of antithetical. A naivete, but you have to know history. So it's the idea that optimism can be a revolutionary act. So I can know how terrible the situation is. There is an asteroid coming. It doesn't look good. The scientists have given up, the military has given up, Bruce Willis is not getting in a rocket ship going to blow it up anytime soon. And I have only a Louisville slugger and my sundress. Now, I can pray, and I mean, I believe in the power of prayer, um, and I can, I can commune, and I believe in the power of, of love connection between human beings, but I value the people that get up on the mountaintop with the baseball bat. And optimism, because everything's going to turn out OK, I, that's called privilege. That's not a revolutionary act at all. That's because you just don't know any better. When you do it and you know, that's what's special. Have you, in your studies, seen any changes in that, or escalation, or um, what factors contribute to that? 
So question is about, about macho, and I, I want to make sure that I, I understand the question right. Um, so you're, you asked about changes in it. Are you talking about over time? Yes. Um, we've been doing this stuff with cops for about a year and a half, so I can't say that we've seen changes over time. Um, we do see that the older you are, the less you tend to exhibit, so that's good. Okay, that's good news, that there's hope. Um, for police, the older you were when you joined the force, the less you tend to exhibit. So that may be an intervention. Um, other things that, that tend to make it go away is we pat them on the ego. Um, which is a hard thing to actually operationalize in the field. Um, it is about the way in which people are constructed, the way in which they learn to become men. And we have found that it's very difficult um, to teach people to be men differently so late in the game once they're already cops. Now, a little bit of good news. Um, I always forget about this data because it's not ready for prime time yet. We have a pilot test where we have told law enforcement officers there are two kinds of men. It's the kind of guy who comes in, gets in a bar fight at the drop of a hat, but always wins, and that's who you are right now. Then there's the kind of guy that would just rather buy everybody around. Everybody goes home safe. That's the kind of man you're going to be. That's the man that will advance here. That's the man that's going to get rewards here. And we tell them that several times during the course of their police academy training. And not only does their bias in use of force go down, but their total use of force tends to go down in this tiny, tiny sample group in the first couple of months out of the academy. So th there is something to be said for shared social norms of different forms of masculinity. Um, but I I'm not quite naive enough to, to think that we've got the solution just yet. I'm standing there with my baseball bat, um, but the asteroid's pretty far away. Question about? Yeah, I think if Black History Month ends up being um, McDonald's having chitlins, then I think we fail. Um, we just get a big F. Um, but I might turn it back to, to you and the other students. What do you think about the other 11 White History Months? Does that work out? Is that okay? Um, I'm happy to have one. You know, didn't always have one. Um, I, I could use two, maybe. Uh, I would encourage you to go and look. Um, the Google and the Internet are lovely tools, and they'll tell you where Black History Month came from, and it came from interesting places. Um, it's not discrimination that we have the shortest month. <laughs> <laughs> Silly people. <clears throat> um, but I mean, I, I, I'm a social scientist. My answer to almost every question is going to be, it depends. Right? And so it, re it does. It really depends. Um, I think it's important to read about slavery in the history of the formation of this nation, but I'd rather not have it be one paragraph that speaks about the unwilling migrant, which is what I got in high school, in my AP history class. Right? So at a private school nearby, just so you know. It's high oat education there. Um, so it, it depends on how you implement it. If Black History Month is something that's used as a, as a wedge and it's divisive and people say, oh, this is the time when we have to, to learn that guy with the peanut and whatever he did, right? Because um, that was, the, I mean, that was the thing. We got Frederick Douglass with the terribly parted afro and we had the guy with the peanut. Um, and that, that was pretty much it. And then we watched Eyes on the Prize over and over and over again. I think I had that, I could lip sync to it by the time I graduated from high school. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's not useful and helpful. Um, but I think, for one month out of the year to remember that for the other 11 months we've been ignoring this, that can be useful. Um, and to get an opportunity to delve in in some kind of depth to learning that this is about American history. And for the longest time we've been learning of US history as if black people and women, by the way, am I know when Women's History Month is? If I say it's coming up. <laughs> they do one after the other so we don't have to spread them out. Um, <clears throat> But for the other 11 months, we don't, we don't pay any attention to the fact that women and black people have anything to do with the formation of the country. And that, I think, is also poor. So one month better than none, I'd prefer that it be experienced by deep learning and soul searching than by you know, chitlins and collards in McDonald's. But sometimes you take what you can get. Here. First off, thank you, Philip. Is Joe Betts here? Yes. Yes. Joe, yeah, I mean, I'd actually 
ask you to ask this question after I do. Um, so it has to do with models of policing, actually, and, and you have written wisely on this matter. I mean, some of the work I do with respect to um, uh, reflection on uh, the use of force in international relations, mm -hmm. the relationship of strategies of war over against policing, have appropriated or tried to deal with coercive law enforcement models of policing over against so-called models of community policing. Community policing, right. Now, and Joe, you, you, you've addressed these things. I'm wondering how those models intersect with, with what you're reflecting on. From one perspective, Community policing is putting the car cart before the horse, or do I have that wrong? So what is the relationship between um, a violence versus a more community-oriented policing right. and masculinity when it comes to equity issues? Um, that is a good, and good question and a difficult one to answer. Uh, so I, I recently came back from my second trip to Brazil where we're consulting with the Brazilian National Police down there, both the, the military police and the, the civil police. And they have a different policing system, but it's, they're only 20 years removed from a military dictatorship um, and an explicit policy of racial oppression. So it's bad. It puts Detroit in perspective. When we were down there the first time, three days beforehand, there was a 15-year-old boy who had shot down a police military helicopter with a surface-to-air missile. So, yeah, violence on a different scale. Uh, but some of the things are the same. Um, I can say that those who are most resistant in the nation of Brazil to community policing um, and proactive policing, which is what we're trying to call it down there, human rights policing is another sort of model for it. Clarence Lusain, who's a good friend and colleague, who's part of the team that's going down to Brazil with us, has written on human rights policing. Um, those who are most resistant are those who are the most macho. And I, I can tell you actually an interesting story. Uh, a director of one of the civilian police academies um, down in, uh, in, in Brazil, I, I won't get too specific. I wouldn't want to call him out. Uh, he's become an ally. We showed up on the first day, and he said, this is BS. He, he didn't say this was BS, but I, I'm being gentler with my language. Um, <clears throat> and all of this human rights stuff and all this diversity stuff, they're criminals. We beat up the criminals, because otherwise they don't go to jail. All right. Came in three days later, because it was an extended trip. And he apologized. But his wife had left him uh, for a man who was younger and more virile. It turns out he was having some problems in the love relationship department. And he said, having had a chance to think about it, he thought this was a good idea. It would keep people safer. It was a wiser decision. Now, why do I tell you the story of the impotent police chief um, <clears throat> with regards to equity? Because he got a chance to read some of the notes that I had prepared on masculinity. And he said, I got to say, it was that that had me resisting. I'm in a position of tremendous power. And when I feel emasculated, I like to flex that power. And that's what I was doing to you on your first day here, and I apologize. It's a big man to go ahead and come, up, come out and say that. I don't know. I think maybe he overshared a little bit. Um, but it allows me to tell this story. Um, and quite literally, the second guy, we call them the, the two people you saw the videos, Cuddles is the first one, and the second one we call Bang Bang. Um, <laughs> bang Bang, I cut it off, um, but I will share, since I am a Hmong family, I will share that after Bang Bang is done putting down his gun, um, there are two female research assistants, they're two graduate students um, of mine who are doing uh, the experiment. He turns around and he said, sorry for the profanity, ladies. As if he needed to make it more clear that this was about his masculinity being put on the line. So I don't think it's an irrelevant set of correlations going on. And I have seen it in international context. I mean, it's the same when we go and we consult in the European Union, in Stockholm, in Australia, in South Africa. Every place we've gone or done this kind of consulting, we need, I, I have come to ask, give me your sissiest commanding officer. Because that's going to be the one that's going to be on board. Here, and then here. Uh, a bunch of different ways. Uh, <clears throat> there is the way that is sort of nice, nicest and neatest for presentations. We have like one of those word searches where you're just looking for words within a, a word jumble. You know the, the kind I'm talking about. Um, and among those words are sometimes negative stereotypes about blacks, negative stereotypes about Latinos. But there are also hidden words like wuss or fairy or pansy. And we give you two minutes to find as many words as you can. We don't tell you what words are in there. So what we do is we take the number of masculinity threat-related words that you found in the two minutes, and we use that as a proxy for your attentional vigilance to masculinity threat cues. And since that correlates with the behavior we're looking for, that's one way that we sort of think, all right, 
that's the right direction we're moving in. We've got scales, we've got other implicit measures. We also are now taking measures of cortisol and testosterone, so we've got um, some psychophysiological measures. Um, when I say we've got a lot of different ways, we've got a lot of different ways to, to manage it. We're, we're about to move into uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, so we're going to do some neuroscience on it. Um, but right now what I like is the word search. Dad. Is there any kind of algorithm that would permit us as educators and as civically mindful agents in the world around us to take your studies and the associated studies that come together as a set of studies dealing with one set of institutions and say, hmm, we're part of the institution. Uh, thank goodness, bang bang's not here that often. But are we functioning in perhaps quite a similar way with our leadership, whether it be the very top central administration, chairpersons, uh, instructors in a classroom, students and the expectations that faculty come to have because the students are where they are. Is there an algorithm, is there some way that those of us who try, that's the big lens, where it would be helpful going forward just as you're saying to the guys as they are beginning their training, mm -hmm. <clears throat> got two models here. Uh, there's, you know, we're in the bar. Boom, boom, boom. I wasn't going to make that the punchline, but okay. <laughs> um, I, I take that sort of in two ways. Uh, Phil, can you be a philosopher? Um, and uh, what's the take-home message? Is there, is there a hole to the sum of these parts? Um, and for those of you who, who were not able to do that rephrasing, many years of dinnertime conversation. <laughs> um, I, I should say that, that this research owes a tremendous debt um, to exactly that kind of, of thinking, um, which uh, obviously you know because we talk about it. Um, but for those of you who have not yet taken your, you know, your honors interdis or your phil intro philosophy courses um, in both logic and in, in moral philosophy, um, if this is at all interesting to you, may I say, if what I've shown you is at all interesting to you, may I say that those courses are invaluable. Because getting it, you know, Plato instead of the little engine that could is irritating when you're three, um, but it's <laughs> invaluable when you're on the way to 33. Um, <coughs> This stuff does translate across platforms and across domains. Um, I do stereotype threat, which is the concern that you're going to be negatively stereotyped because of a, of a group membership you've got. So, oh my goodness, you're going to think I'm not good at sports because I'm queer. You're going to think I'm not good at math because I'm a woman. Right? You're going to think I'm not good at speaking the truth because I work for Fox, New Fox News. These sorts of things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and for police officers, you're going to think I'm not good at doing my job because I'm racist. Um, educators are worried about it about being seen as racist. Um, and the consequences are not that they, they're, therefore, well, they're walking on eggshells and political correctness is so difficult. They do racist stuff in response, right? The racist stuff they tend to do is they say, I don't want you near me because you make me think about how racist I might be. And so it's terrible because you have a racist conception of racism, which is that racism is all about white people, right? And then you have a racist response to having, to th have, having been forced to think about racism. Right? And black people just screwed all over the place. So does it translate? Yes. But it translates differently. You have to understand the context. And so there is no direct algorithm, not at least one that I've been smart enough to, to come up with. Um, and there are smarter people than me working on this stuff. Um, I just don't tell anybody about them because then I wouldn't get invited to come out to Philadelphia. Um, so I, I don't know that there's, there's going to be a simple way to translate it, to port it from policing to education um, to government, to campaigns, which is a whole other thing. Um, but I would say that some of the principles that we're extracting here are broad principles of our contemporary racial conundrum. Um, and that 
it doesn't have to be that you've got a badge and a gun to care about how masculinity threat creates inequality, not just for the, gen the various genders you might have in a room, but for the various races, religious orientations, sexual orientations, so forth and so on. Here? The three queer police officers um, in Denver did not participate in our study. Um, let me say that again. The three queer police officers in the Denver Police Department did not participate in our study. Okay? That is a rhetorical technique called hyperbole. Um, there are more than three. Uh, I don't think there are more than ten. Um, and so it's not statistically useful to be thinking about that. Right? Um, at the same time, I think it's tremendously important because you don't see feminine, uh, feminine identity able to be threatened in the same way. Right? Feminine identity is more protean. It's not as easily lost. It's not as hard fought to gain in the same kinds of ways. Right? We police masculinity, I mean both metaphorically and literally, in a way that we don't police femininity. And the policing of masculinity are the ways in which we police sexual orientation as well. Which is why, you know, the don't ask, don't tell. Well, we, we imagine, who are the people who are on television? Who are the people that we're thinking, these people want to be in the military and it's wrong, but they can't. They are the Asian American uh, Arab translator, who's male. They are the cadet who was hazed out of the Navy, who was male. Here's a secret. The vast majority of queer people in the armed services are women. And no one cares. We police homosexuality because we're policing masculinity. Because to guys, lesbians are hot, so I don't care. Right? But if you cut your hair short and you're not hot, then you're defying what I need you to be as a man, and then I'll police you. Then you get the scary stuff written on the lockers. Okay? So they're intricately linked. But we can't study them in policing because policing is a wildly, egregiously, aggressively, unapologetically homophobic and heterosexist culture. Except for one fantastically cross-dressing guy um, down in Brazil who was absolutely RuPaul fabulous, who actually <laughs> does the diversity training in one of the, the, the centers, gets no kind of credit or respect from anybody around, but was, had some high heels that I could not believe. Other than this individual. There, you just don't see it anywhere. It's a great question. You got one here? And I, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can we get the last hands? Because I'm seeing somebody about to jump out of their seat to, to stop me. So no. this will be the last question. Make it good. So it, this is a question essentially on some level about affirmative action? Yes. OK. Um, I have a very radical stance um, politically. So I should, I should own up. Um, my radical stance is that I am pro-good anti-evil. <laughs> um, and as a result of being pro-good and anti-evil, I, I think it is bad, it is evil, when we say, you group of people cannot come in because of you're being in a group. Okay? That's the sort of fundamental justice sense that most people have. The querying of affirmative action has come because people have said, well, it's this dominant group over here that's not allowed in. Okay? That's not really true. If you got rid of affirmative action, then what would happen is the white people that have to go to Brown, mm, horrible, they get to go to Harvard, about 1%. So you get a 1% shift in people who are already going to college, going to slightly better colleges. Okay? If there were no brown people. Now with affirmative action, what you see is a 28% increase in the total amount of black and brown people who get college degrees at all. Okay? And that is with athletic scholarships, which despite the fact that we think that football and basketball, and by the way, women's rugby team, 
Anyone? There? No? So, okay. It's me and my dad rooting for the women's rugby team of Villanova. Y'all should be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah. National, National champions. National champions, I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Okay, you know, we're going to have that conversation later. Um, <clears throat> but the vast majority of athletic scholarships go to white students. Um, <clears throat> and despite Title IX, the majority go to men. Okay. Um, and legacy, which almost every college and university will say, I am perfectly happy um, to admit that we uh, have legacy admits. Legacy is the grandfather clause of academia. It's affirmative action for white people, has been for generations. Okay. So those are still in place. Affirmative action essentially for white men is still in place. And still, with this affirmative action, get rid of it, there's a 1% downgrade or upgrade in attending colleges, right? Without it, you get a 28% drop in the total number of people from those backgrounds being allowed to get an education. And here's the key part. Once they get in, they achieve at similar rates, they earn more money, and more importantly, they give more than double back to both the school and the communities in which they choose to live. They are, by every metric, better citizens having received that, have received that college education. So being pro-good and anti-evil, I am in favor of the effects. The method, I don't know is that clear. The method is very divisive. People have real sinister feelings about it. Um, and because we don't have a very mature dialogue about it, I don't know that we can say that it's clear cut, it's good and evil. But the consequences of affirmative action are unequivocal. Everybody benefits, nobody loses. I think that's all of them. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to be safe. Well done. You worked pretty hard, but.